Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to day three of Marxist University. We hope you've been enjoying the event so far and you'll continue to do so. And if you're just joining, welcome. My name is Joe Attars. I'm a member of Socialist Appeal, a Marxist organization in Great Britain. And I'm delighted to be chairing this session on historical materialism. I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment, but first a few matters of business. After this short introduction, we'll have our main talk, which will last for 90 minutes. After which we will have a short 25 minute break. And then we will return for contributions from other comrades and participants. If you've just joined Marxist University, you'll notice that the speakers pause between sentences. That's because we are translating this event in about 13 different languages, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Arabic, Chinese, and so on. It might seem a little strange, but please bear with us. If you go on to, when you enter uh, the Marcus University website on the left-hand side of the screen, then you'll see a little star which you can click to access our schedule of talks for the day. And underneath that, there's a speech box which is called translations. from which you can access all the Discord servers to different languages, which is how we're doing our translations. That's all for business. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker who is Josh Holroyd, a writer and activist, also with Socialist Appeal. Who will be introducing this discussion on historical materialism. Okay, Josh, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, thanks, Joe. And hello to everybody watching. Thanks for joining us. When Marx and Engels first developed the basic principles of historical materialism, they changed history, and in more ways than one. First, they revolutionized the study of history by for the first time placing it on a real scientific basis. But in doing this, they also created a powerful instrument for the revolutionary transformation of society by the working class.
But what we have to understand from the beginning is that this has not been a welcome development from the standpoint of the ruling class. So it shouldn't surprise you to hear that there is not a single one of Marx's ideas that has not been declared out of date and refuted by the ruling class and its lackey professors in the universities. And sadly, there is not a single bourgeois attack on Marxism that has not also been taken up and incorporated into so-called Marxist academia. This is not simply of academic interest. As we, as we saw re recently with David Harvey's statements about revolution, revisionism in theory goes hand in hand with opportunism in practice. So this imposes a duty upon us as Marxists to study and defend the real method and ideas of Marxism. Like a master craftsman cares for his tools. or a soldier cares for his weapons because they are ultimately the only weapons we have. And we cannot afford for them to be taken from us. So in the limited time available to me, I intend to look at some of the most important attacks on historical materialism. and hopefully offer a defense and explanation of the most fundamental principles of the Marxist approach to history. The most basic premise of scientific socialism is that historical development is determined by objective laws that can be understood, however imperfectly, by human beings. But even this idea is dismissed by the dominant trend in historical academia today. Perhaps the most concise explanation of this trend was given in the early 20th century um, by the monopolist Henry Ford. Who famously said, history is bunk, meaning nonsense. But today you can see this idea that it is impossible to explain rather than simply describe events you can see this everywhere it is of course a major feature of postmodernism which has been dealt with already in an any more time with that.
But there is another, perhaps more subtle version of this argument. That while it may be possible to understand history in some sense, it cannot be understood scientifically. For example, in his very popular book, Sapiens, have it here, in case you want to see what it looks like, borrowed, the liberal writer, Yuval Noah Harari, short sure, Yuval Noah Harari, argues that history cannot be a science. We can only explain how and not why things happened as they did. Because you cannot make specific predictions. To which he contrasts the natural sciences and bizarrely economics. For this reason, Marxism is apparently a religion. In which Marx's predictions about the development of capitalism and the necessity of revolution play the same role as the prophecies of the book of Revelation, for example. Now, the fact that almost all of Marx's so-called prophecies have been completely confirmed since his death is, of course, not mentioned. One might immediately ask, if something can't be understood scientifically, then can it be understood at all? And we can see that every attempt to understand history that does not take a scientific approach inevitably just takes the ruling prejudices of the time and smears them across history in order to justify their existence. And this goes doubly for Harari's book. But even allowing for this, If the sole criterion for science is that it can make precise predictions, then this would rule out most of even the natural sciences. Weather, earthquakes, all manner of things cannot be predicted with mathematical precision. Even in physics, at the quantum level, scientists deal with probability. By this logic, we should abandon trying to explain anything. In fact, it is an argument against science as a whole. But another argument he makes is that because society is made up of conscious human beings, that's 10 minutes gone, Josh. Our predictions affect the outcome of events. 
making history too chaotic to predict. The example he gives is if somebody had been able to create an algorithm that could predict events with 100% accuracy, and used it to show Hosni Mubarak in 2010 that there would be a revolution in Egypt in a year's time, The predicted revolution would not have happened because Mubarak would have spent mil billions on state handouts and added security. Thus falsifying the prediction. But let's look at this a little closer. First of all, upon receiving this prophecy, where was Mubarak supposed to find the billions of dollars to dish out to the population? One of the driving factors in the Arab revolution was austerity policies and cuts to state subsidies for fuel and other necessities. These cuts were the product of the very real, deterministic and knowable limits of Egyptian capitalism in a period of global crisis. In the short term, he could have reversed the cuts and borrowed billions more to stave off the 2011 re revolution. The Tory government in Britain is doing the same thing right now. But then what? Exactly the same demands would be raised by the masses. The state would become increasingly bankrupt. And Mubarak's policies would likely just pave the way for an even greater explosion further down the line. So the only way the prediction could be completely falsified is if in response, the Egyptian dictator either suspended the laws of capitalism by magic, that would work, or if he abolished capitalism in order to provide the people with necessities. Which would itself be a revolution. In every revolution in history, there's been a section of the ruling class that knows what's coming. And pushes for reforms from above to prevent revolution from below. Quite often, these very reforms have roused the masses further. Making revolution inevitable. The reason for this is not because revolutions are totally random. But because their causes lie much deeper 
than individual rulers are able to go. And it is the task of history, or any serious study of history, to discover precisely these causes and understand them. The argument that objective historical laws are unknowable is simply an admission by the writer that he has no idea what they are. As Trotsky said, theory is the victory of foresight over astonishment. Well, this is astonishment elevated to a theory. But if we accept that there are objective laws to historical development and that these laws can be understood, then how do we discover and grasp those laws? Before Marx, the dominant theory of history was that since history is made by humans, and humans are conscious beings, then the study of history is simply the study of the various ideas that have guided people across the ages. In short, history was determined by the mind. This idealist conception of history was brilliantly overthrown by Marx. For the first time, it become, became possible to genuinely understand history and not just describe it. In the words of Engels, just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. What was this law? Marx discovered the driving force in history, not in the head, in the ideas and deeds of great men, etc., but in the hand, in labor, which he described as an eternal natural necessity. Which mediates the metabolism between man and nature. And therefore human life itself. In his preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy, published in 1859, the same year as Darwin's Origin of the Species, by the way, Marx wrote these famous lines. And sorry for the long quote here. 
in the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations which are independent of their will, Namely, relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. Oh, have you already translated that? Sorry. The, to the totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. The real foundation on which arises a legal a political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence determines their consciousness. Ever since he wrote those lines, the entire intellectual establishment has been on a quest to refute them. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the last 150 years of social science has been little more than a relentless attack on this idea. This paragraph even. Harari, again, expresses the dominant prejudice with typical crudeness when he says the following. Since large scale human cooperation is based on myths, the way people cooperate can be altered by changing the myths. by telling different stories. But aside from this openly reactionary idealism, there are actually plenty of self-proclaimed socialists who have found more subtle and pernicious ways to challenge the basic ideas of historical materialism. Take Anthony Giddens, now Lord Giddens. Who is well known in Britain as the main theorist of Blairism. In 1989, Giddens wrote a critique of historical materialism. In which he described himself as a libertarian socialist. And claimed to salvage the good bits of Marx's ideas from what he considered to be his more out of date ideas. So which of Marx's ideas are now out of date? First, according to Giddens, 
Marx was wrong to regard human beings as above all tool making and using animals. Human social life neither begins nor ends in production. Instead, he says the search for meaning is closer to supplying the basis for a philosophical anthropology of human culture than Marx was. The, the search for meaning is closer to supplying the basis for a philosophical anthropology of human culture than Marx was. Yeah, sorry for the language. I don't write this stuff. Uh, so we return to classic idealism. It is consciousness that separates us from the animals and therefore forms the basis for human history. But when and how did the separation take place? Presumably, at some point, one of our ape-like ancestors woke up one morning and decided to begin his search for meaning. And along the way, he developed fire and tools in order to sustain his mortal body. During his quest for the immortal soul. But even the most incorrigible idealist would accept that this great leap did not take place before the evolution of the human brain. But the study of the evolution of the human brain challenges that theory. Our earliest known hominin ancestor called Lucy lived and died over three million years ago. Her brain is no bigger than that of a chimpanzee. And yet she was more human than a chimpanzee. Why? Because what she did have was an early form of the human hand. Specifically, the precision grip. Which allowed, among other things, the production of tools to help her satisfy her needs. This is where human evolution begins. Not in the head, but in the hand. The first stone tools yet discovered are two and a half million years old. Much older than Homo sapiens as a species. Thirty minutes gone, Josh. Thanks. As labour became more complex, so did our brains. Which not only became larger, but also had expanded areas for things like language and abstract thought.
In changing its natural surroundings, humanity changed itself. So it turns out that humanity's search for meaning, whatever that actually means, I must admit, I'm still searching for the meaning of that expression. Regardless, this is itself a product of labor. What is especially significant is that the most modern studies of our earliest ancestors confirm not the idealism of Giddens from 1989, but the materialism of Frederick Engels. who put forward this theory of human evolution years before it was conclusively confirmed by research. But having redefined humanity for us, Giddens now takes a look at society. Oh, if, if you're interested, the, the um, pamphlet in which Engels makes this, that puts this theory forward is called The Part Played by Labour in the Transition from Ape to Man. But what does Giddens say about human society? Modes of the production of material life are not, in tribal or class divided societies, the chief motor of social change. Neither is class struggle. According to Giddens, is the possession of authoritative resources in other words political control that has determined the course of history up until capitalism As evidence for this, he points to the origin of the state. He explains, the Neolithic revolution did not mechanically bring about an overturning of the social order. It is the political break that is decisive and not the economic transformation. Now the idea that economic development automatically and mechanically brings about changes in social relations is a very common straw man used to accuse Marxism of technological or economic determinism. But it has nothing to do with Marxism. Ironically, if Marx genuinely believed that social relations passively and mechanically follow technological developments,
he would not have been a revolutionary. Revolution would be unnecessary and impossible. Because every technological innovation would bring about some small change in social relations. Until society gradually evolved into a future of greater and greater prosperity. This is the mythology of the liberals, not Marxism. But let us take Giddens' example at face value. He argues that the advent of agriculture did not change social relations, but politics, force in the form of the state did. The first thing that must be pointed out here is the Neolithic revolution quite obviously did transform society. Before agriculture, all human societies lived a nomadic life moving from place to place. The transition to permanent settlements and a new division of labor completely changed the way people live their lives. Including not only production, but the family and religion. But for lack of time, let's go straight to the state. Giddens states that writing was, uh, writing was instrumental in the formation of the state. And this, allowed, this rather than agriculture, changed social relations permanently. But how? Giddens mentions that writing was first used to make lists. Yes, but lists of what? For roughly a thousand years before the first king lists, Mesopotamian priests were writing lists of the goods contained in their temple stores. This gives us a clue to the real origin of the state in Mesopotamia. The first ever forms of agriculture did not immediately ensure the level of surplus to maintain a state. That should not surprise anybody. But agriculture continued to develop. And to use the example of Mesopotamia, The production of a surplus capable of sustaining a state did not, arise, did not arise until the introduction of irrigation farming to the marshes of what is now southern Iraq. In settlements from this place and time, roughly 6,000 years ago,
we see for the first time communal temple areas. Where surplus product was taken as offerings. What does this mean? In these settlements, we see the physical evidence of a qualitatively new division of labor in society. That between the hand and the head, if you like. With the majority working the fields and a minority who could devote their time to mental work. This work was done, uh, work like uh, measurement, mathematics, writing. Uh, work like measurement, mathematics, writing. This work was done by the priests. Writing, therefore, was developed as a result of the production and distribution of this surplus. Not simply for the sake of power in the abstract, or for ideology on its own, sadly for Giddens, historically speaking, the poet and the accountant have the same mother, the same origin. But still we see no state, only a temple at this stage. Over time, we see larger temples and more and more inequality. And eventually, a bit over 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, about 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. All of these early cities entered into crisis at roughly the same time. All of the contradictions building up. Come to the surface and quantity is transformed into quality. Perhaps some external crisis like a drought or over farming reduced the level of surplus available. But crucially, the privileged layer at the top could no longer ensure the surplus it required. Later, within a couple of hundred years, really, we see the same cities re-emerging in the same place, but this time with a temple and a palace, which in Sumerian is Egal, if I'm pronouncing it right. which literally translates as big house. And in the big house lived the Lugal, which literally translates as the big man. 
The dawn of the state had finally come. And only then did scribes start writing the lists of kings and stories about superhuman kings like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which have come down to us today. In this sense, writing executed the functions of the state. It did not create them. And actually, a few states have existed without writing. Such as the Incan Empire, for example. Now, how can we explain this? Engels, in The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, He explained the state is an admission by society that has it, become divided into irreconcilable class interests. Between those who produce and those who appropriate the surplus. And in his words, in order that these antagonisms and classes with conflicting economic interests might not consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle. It became necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this power is the state. From this point, does the whole of history become the history of class struggles, as Marx puts it. But of course, Giddens still doesn't agree. And he explains, class relations do not govern the basic character of production in either the ancient world or in feudalism. The slave or serf are not workers nor is their labor separated from their relation to nature and to the community. If he's saying that a slave is not the same as a wage worker under capitalism, then we're in agreement. But I think the idea that the slave is not a worker because he doesn't work in a factory for a wage would not be taken seriously by the slaves. This is another classic example of the method of liberalism. Fifty minutes gone, Josh, 40 remaining. Giddens takes capitalist production as his starting point. Looks for it throughout history. And having not found it prior to capitalism, he declares there can be no workers and no class struggle either.
Bizarrely, though, we even have self-styled Marxists putting forward this same idea. Samir Amin, for example, states that prior to capitalism, ideology is the dominant instance. This idea that the political determines the economic in ancient and medieval society whereas the economic determines the political under capitalism, because it's a market economy. This is actually very common in Marxist academia. I mean, I have to ask what good is a historical materialism which only applies to capitalism? But worse, in correcting Marx, these people actually take us further back even than the ancient historians. Thucydides was not a Marxist. Thucydides, sorry. But he saw, that he saw that beneath the political struggle of Athenian democracy, there were material class interests. And it was this struggle between the oligarchy and the mob, as he saw it, that drove the Peloponnesian War to its unhappy conclusion for Athens. Likewise, you could characterize the history of the Middle Ages in, in your in Europe, at least, probably more, more wide than that. As the struggle of different religious sects. Such as that between Protestantism and Catholicism, for example. But it is easy to see that beneath all of these religious ideas, lay the interests of the various classes in feudal society. Such as the bourgeoisie in the towns. Bourgeois means town dweller, someone who lives in a town. who played an essential role in the Reformation. Marx even answered this argument himself in the first volume of Capital. Where he writes, this much, however, is clear. That the Middle Ages could not live on Catholicism nor the ancient world on politics. On the contrary, it is the mode in which they gained a livelihood that explains why here politics and their Catholicism played the chief part. Marxism has never denied the important role of consciousness, of force, and of the state.
To attempt to explain history without the intervention of political struggles and ideas. would give us a false and one-sided view. But to take the political ideas of the time as an independent factor, outside of the economic and class context, gives us only form without content. And ultimately explains nothing. And now we come to a major point of controversy with Marx's work. Progress. Marxist philosophy sees the whole course of development of matter, life, and human society as part of a never ending process of evolution. But this has nothing in common with so called social Darwinism. which presents a false picture of evolution in order to justify the domination of society by the rich. What Darwin showed to the horror of respectable bourgeois society was that all species, including our own, have not always existed. Are not the product of some special plan, but are the result of millions of years of natural selection, uh, evolution by natural selection. A product of history, if you like. Darwin put us in our place biologically. Marx put us in our place socially and historically. He demonstrated that every form of society in existence was not the natural and permanent expression of human nature. Or uh, the result of some preordained plan. But the product of thousands of years of evolution. He showed that in society, as in nature, all that exists deserves to perish. This social evolution is not determined by biology or human nature. But by the development of the productive forces. 60 minutes gone, Josh, 30 remaining. Which mediate our interaction with nature and with it the foundations of human society. But contrary to the liberal conception of process, progress even, which sees history as a gradual and linear process of moral and economic enlightenment,
culminating in modern liberal democratic dem uh, capitalism. Marxism sees progress as inherently contradictory and made up of revolutionary leaps. Crucially, forms of society that had at one stage further development will at a certain stage turn into their opposite. In his famous preface, Marx writes in another long quote, at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Then begins an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation lead sooner or later to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. Now I've already discussed how this took form in the state, the, the origin of the state. But we also see this in the transition from one form of class society to another higher form. And we see it right before our eyes today in the crisis of capitalism. But this idea is indignantly re rejected by many academics. Including, of course, Giddens. who proudly puts forward a non-evolutionary theory of history. He says that if we take an evolutionary view of history and think of societal change in terms of stages, And this is wrong because the emergence of class divided societies did not eliminate tribal societies from the world, in his words. Sure, yeah, this, this idea, according to Giddens, this is wrong because the emergence of class society did not eliminate all tribal societies from the world. All we learn from this is that Giddens and others who indignantly reject an evolutionary approach to history understand neither evolution nor history. Is it the case in nature that when great evolutionary leaps take place, such as the first creatures to live on land, all other species on earth have either followed suit or died out. Do we live in a world populated only by vertebrates?
It's necessary only to pose the question to see the absurdity of what has been argued here. Contrary to the crude caricature of Marxism presented by Stalinist two-stage theory, Marxism does not insist that every single society must pass through the same course of development. That is not how evolution works. Rather, each individual society comes into being in a certain geographic and historical environment. Including, crucially, the level of development of the productive forces already attained. This has a determining effect on its social relations, classes, and further development. In fact, the constant presence of an interaction between societies at different stages of development which Trotsky calls combined and uneven development is itself a powerful factor in the progress of society as a whole. More backward societies rapidly appropriate the achievements of others. Without necessarily needing to go through the same process of development. This creates giant leaps in development. Taking Greece as an example. Ingalls pointed out that class society and the state in Athens arose when there was already iron technology and tools. Which allowed for rain fed agriculture to be much, much more productive than before. There was the extensive trading of commodities with other civilizations. And even money at this point. All of these things contributed to the nature of Athenian class society. With its chattel slavery and high level of private property relations. Now, what is the picture in ancient Egypt? Seventy minutes on, Josh. Which the Greeks considered the original civilization, and they weren't far wrong. But really wrong. Totally different. Egyptian class society arose on the basis of Bronze Age technology.
on a surplus produced by irrigation farming along the Nile. Carried out by village communities and overseen by the temple and state bureaucracy. And money did not arise in any form until after the birth of the state. Its relations were qualitatively different. Whoa. Because they had evolved at a much earlier stage in the development of the productive forces. But without the development that took place in Egypt and other Bronze Age empires like Assyria, Babylon, and um, Mycenaean Greece, uh, in Bronze Age Greece, it, it would be it's very unlikely that the great achievements of Athenian civilization would have ever come about. But that new form of Greek slave society represented a new stage in the development of class society and opened up further development. development. And look at the development of, and look at the development of capitalism, for example. It took England roughly 300 years to develop mature industrialized capitalism out of feudalism or from feudalism. Japan went from an agrarian feudal society to an industrial capitalist economy in the space of a single generation, pretty much. But could we really say that this leap did not const constitute a leap forward in any sense? which is what the postmodernists argue. And some um, so-called Marxists. Ultimately, the denial of progress is nothing more than the reflection of the irreversible decline of capitalism. Under which further progress is impossible. It is essentially the reactionary demand that the working class cannot and must not fight for progress now. Harari, again, argues that economic development does not necessarily lead to greater happiness or better lives for everyone. <clears throat> That's true enough. But as long as we live under class society, the collective power of the human race will never mean greater freedom and prosperity for all. On this contradiction rests the entirety of the class struggle. The struggle over the surplus produced by uh, the development of the productive forces.
Today, no amount of further technological or economic development brings further progress for the vast majority of the population. What development has taken place only serves to exacerbate the crisis of capitalism and the oppression of the masses. This does not refute progress. What this proves is that under class society, there is no progress without class struggle. And ultimately without revolution. Sometimes the denial of progress is dressed up as standing up for non-capitalist societies. Sometimes the denial of progress is dressed up as standing up for non-capitalist societies. To spare the feelings of societies that have been brutally destroyed by capitalism, Even many so-called Marxists refuse to speak of progress at all. As if it is a liberal idea, only a liberal idea. One self-styled critical Marxist Uh, a Marxist who calls herself a critical Marxist, Ellen Mike Sins Wood only uses the term process. But what is this supposed to mean? Where is this process taking us? Today, billions of people sense one way or another the impossibility of moving forward under the present system. And they want desperately to find a way out. What is this other than a semi-conscious striving for progress? But if there's no such thing, then we must conclude that the overthrow of capitalism, the eradication of poverty, and the, uh, or the oppression of women, the end of the oppression of women, would not constitute genuine progress for humanity. If you'll believe that, you'll believe anything. The only society this view defends is capitalism. Today, to believe that a higher stage in the evolution of society is even possible, but more importantly, is inevitable and necessary is a revolutionary act, just that. But whereas the denial of progress for all time is just as false and reactionary as the claims of people like Steven Pinker and Bill Gates Eighty minutes long, Josh. Ten minutes remaining. Who constantly praise the silent miracle of poverty reduction under capitalism? Uh, 
at the same time, the world's poor face catastrophe. They are two sides of the same coin. Both rule out the struggle of the working class for its emancipation. which today constitutes the motor force of progress. Now this brings us to the final straw man of Marxism, which is regularly used on the right and the left. The idea that Marxism considers everything Every event inevitable. That it is fatalistic and therefore denies human agency in history. Instead, we're told, history is all about possibilities. To quote Harari one last time, though I'm sure you're tired of him. We study history not to know the future, but to widen our horizons. To understand that our present situation is neither natural nor inevitable. and that we consequently have many more possibilities before us than we might imagine. How inspiring. But he's not the only one. Let's take the socialist Giddens again for the last time. The relation between capitalism and socialism in the modern world has a double implication. As an existing series of phenomena, and as an open series of possibilities. such as the possibility of a third way between capitalism and socialism, which is what Blairism tried to do. And finally, let's take the Marxist, Ellen Mike Sins Wood. She says, the relevant category in characterizing the socialist project is not inevitability, but precisely possibility. Now this is very comforting, but it offers no concrete way of realizing any of these abstract possibilities. Is that empty possible? This kind of possibility is empty. And I, could, I couldn't help but um, recall a, a quote from Hegel in relation to this. He said, in philosophy in particular, there should never be a word said of showing that it is possible. Or, or it is conceivable. 
The same consideration should warn the writer of history. But the subtlety of the empty understanding finds its chief pleasure in the fantastic ingenuity of suggesting possibilities and lots of possibilities. Ultimately, whether a thing is possible or impossible does not depend on whether you can imagine it happening, but on the real existing elements and dynamics of the thing in question. In society, the objective laws that determine the general direction of society, in this case, capitalism. But what possibilities do these correctors of Marx offer, offer us? Despite saying we can't predict the future, Harari tells us that liberal capitalism will produce AI, which will solve climate change and make us immortal by 2050. Where does human agency come into that? Giddens philosophy gave us the political project of Blairism. which as we know from experience requires that the masses are as little involved in politics as possible. And simply leave a bureaucratic clique of careerists to manage society on their behalf, and not very well. It basically tells the workers, wait and vote Labour at the next election. That's their agency. That's what they get to do. The Marxist would says nothing at all. Democracy, we should have democracy. With no concrete explanation of how we're supposed to have this uh, socialist democracy. Now, who gains from this? The capitalists, the status quo. This method defends the, continuous, uh, the continu uh, continuation of their failed system. The concrete possibility of socialism is nothing other than the inevitable development and centralization of global production under capitalism. The inevitable growth and continued oppression of the working class. Which is forced into struggle. and the deeper and deeper crisis of the capitalist system. That's 90 minutes, Josh, please sum up. Which is the inevitable product of the contradiction between the immense social production and narrow private appropriation of the capitalists. In reality, history is not a question of mere possibility, but of necessity.
What is, nece what is the necessary outcome of the fundamental processes taking place? And what is necessary for the emancipation of the working class? And for the further development and liberation of humanity as a whole. Marxists have never denied agency. Marx himself said that men make their own history. But they do not do so in circumstances of their own choosing. Marxism is the conscious expression um, of the movement of history. And our consciousness of this movement demands that we too must move. This is why Marxism, for all its determinism, is a philosophy of action. By grasping the objective laws of history, it becomes possible to consciously intervene and change society. And it's necessary to do so as well. Only then is real human agency possible. We fight to end the capitalist system, which is in inevitable decay. To bring into being a new world free of exploitation, free of poverty, and in control of its destiny. That is real freedom. It is not enough to think. It is not even enough to know. Historical materialism demands that we act. As Marx said so long ago, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Thank you.